Hello everyone, this is Paul Malutnock, and uh, it's been a year in the book of Revelation. We are now about to talk about the lesson, chapter 22, the last lesson in this book of Revelation. It's been a great ride, it's been very informative, and I hope it's been challenging to our lives to live knowing Christ is going to return soon as the Bible promises. So let's begin with chapter 22. Uh, if you, if you uh, think about it, uh, chapter 22 contains God's last message to humankind. At the close of the Bible, we're reintroduced to the tree of life, which has not been mentioned in the Bible since Genesis with Adam and Eve, sin in the Garden of Eden, uh, paradise is restored in the eternal state. If you remember the last chapter, in this chapter we'll be talking about the eternal state, not the millennium, but the eternal state where we are going to be with Christ uh, forever and reign with him. Uh, all that was lost in the fall is now redeemed by the Lamb. The leaves of the tree of life will be used to heal relationships of the nations towards each other so that we might live equitably and fairly in eternity. The picture of eternal life in these verses indicates that we will be busy serving God for all eternity. We'll serve him and we will reign with him. We will see his face, which we couldn't do in this life. That means that all believers will be granted an audience with the king on a regular basis, Jesus Christ. So let's look at verse one. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. <clears throat> so this pure river of water of life uh, flows from the throne of God, from heaven. It's the source of eternal life that emanates from God the river is unlike any river uh, we know because there's no hydrological uh, cycle uh, in the eternal state as there is now. The water of life symbolizes that continuous flow of eternal life forever and ever to the throne, to the inhabitants uh, of, of uh, heaven. Jesus told the woman at the well if she drank of the water, he gave her, she would never thirst again. And that's in the fourth chapter of John. And that water possessed life-giving powers. And that's the, the source is Father and the Lamb. And that water springs up to everlasting life. And that is from Christ. Just like everything else in New Jerusalem, the river was clear as crystal so that it could reflect the glory of God as it cascades down from the throne of God and the Lamb. And in a sparkling, dazzling, never-ending flow of everlasting life. Verse 2. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on the other side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So a symbol of both eternal life and continual blessing, that tree bears twelve fruits, uh, one for each month, uh, and is, of course, symbolic of the abundant uh, life and the infinite variety of things in heaven. Uh, the English word is therapeutic, comes from the Greek, healing, and somehow there's, it's full and satisfying. The uh, tree of life was present in the Garden of Eden, as we remember, Adam and Eve uh, did not eat of it. It was in the center of the garden, uh, I believe this tree is Jesus. Uh, when we partake of him, we have life. This tree offers perpetual life and health as well as food. Um, it's monthly. Since time exists no more, perhaps uh, it emphasizes the expression of the joyous provision of eternity using familiar terms of time that we use today. Um, the nations, it just means the people that are in heaven. Sickness no longer will be, so it's not going to heal us from illness, 
um, but it just is, is a fully energized, rich and exciting, continuous life that it gives. The scripture also doesn't tell us if we'll eat the leaves or the fruit. Angels ate food on earth, and Abraham and Sarah, as did uh, uh, with Abraham and Sarah, the angels there, uh, <clears throat> as Jesus did uh, after the resurrection with his disciples. Perhaps the saints in heaven will eat for enjoyment and not out of necessity. We're not sure of that. The verse 3, no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servant servants will worship him. So there'll be no more curse, the curse on humanity on the earth, because of Adam and Eve's disobedience will be finished. God will never have to judge sin again since he'll never exist in the new heaven and the new earth. The curse of the land is gone. God would not be present if there were any curse left. So the picture of eternal life in these verses indicates that we'll be busy serving God for all eternity. <clears throat> we will both serve him and reign with him. He's an infinite God, so we can be sure he will have infinite things for us to do and reign forever. So we saw the Lamb of God and the throne of God. On his right hand is the Lamb. These servants that mentioned uh, shall serve him. That's us. We will serve him. We Christians have been bought and paid for by the blood of the Lamb. We will be with the Lamb and the Father, but we will not be their equal. We will be their servants. Verse 4, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Now, uh, they shall see his face means that we will be granted a constant audience with the king. He see his face, of course, no unglorified human could see God's face and live. But the residents of heaven can look upon God's face without harm because they are now holy with God. The greatest blessing of eternity is that we shall see his face. It's called the beatific vision by theologians. The name of God is on their foreheads, and that shows ownership and consecration to him. Even Moses, who was so close to God, wanted to see God, and God told him no. He put his hand over Moses and passed by him, and Moses saw his backside. And there will be, uh, in his presence, we will be all the time. Look on his face any time we want. We are sealed with the Lamb's seal. One uh, teacher said the saints in New Jerusalem will see God's face being perfectly holy and righteous. They'll be able to endure the blazing, glorious light from God's presence without being consumed that was impossible for mortal men. Verse 5, and night will be no more. They will need no lamp or light or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. Since in the New Jerusalem, God is always present, his glory makes all other sources of light unnecessary. But we shall reign with him. Heaven's citizens are more than servants. Uh, we reign with him. As the final word describing the saints' heavenly experience, they are told it once again that it will never end. It will be continuous. Verse 6, And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. Christ speaks the sixth blessing of beatitude to those who treat the prophecies of this book as faithful and true, and then live according to that. We are to live according to that today, knowing his word is faithful and true. We trust his word, we believe his word, and therefore our walk is with his word and with him. Now his servants, members of the seven churches of Asia Minor, who received this letter, and then all believers who have read it since, and that includes us. The things which must shortly be done, well, this involves the entire revelation uh, which God has just related, the entire book. So verses 6 through 21 sort of form a conclusion or a summary to the book with two themes, uh, the authenticity of the book, 
as a revelation from God and the imminence of the return of Christ. These sayings refer to the entire book of Revelation, and they are authenticated as genuine by the angel. God sent the angel to give them to John, to his servants, that is, the members of the churches. Uh, here is just a reassurance of all that is not to be taken lightly, even today. This is the absolute truth. The prophets such as Daniel, Ezekiel, and Isaiah, just to name some of them, uh, have all spoken of this special time in history, in Revelation. We, we got a lot of our uh, scriptures that we talk about in Revelation from uh, the prophets. So it's not all from uh, the angel to John in this case. It comes from the entire Bible. And the messages are also supported by uh, Matthew chapter 24, Luke 21 and 22. In the same uh, information, regardless of who pens it, because the author is God. So it comes from the apostles, it came from uh, the prophets and, and others that God gave the authority to do that. The angel's words reinforce this important truth that everything John saw in Revelation will come to pass, that John's words are not mystical and apocalyptic, is only a record of uh, the bizarre dreams of the result of an overactive imagination. That's not the case in Revelation. Further, it is not even an allegory in forms of translation from which readers can find hidden meanings on their own concoctions. It is an accurate description of events and persons that are yet to come. So let's look at verse uh, 7. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Notice that in verse 7 and verse 12, he says, Behold, I am coming quickly. And down in verse 20, yes, I am coming quickly. And this is the term tachu or taku, from which we get tachometer, which measures speed. He says, I'm coming speedily. I'm hastily coming. I'm coming quickly or I'm coming shortly. I'm coming soon. Six times in the book of Revelation, that is stated. Twice it is a warning, chapter 2, verses 5 and 16, that he's coming quickly with judgment on his mind. Four times it's a promise, a promise of blessing. <clears throat> the three in chapter 22 and one in chapter 3. This is Jesus speaking when he says, Behold, I come quickly. Jesus' return is imminent. <clears throat> Blessed is he who keeps the saying of the prophecy of this book, is referring to the reading of of the book of Revelation. But how in the world can you keep the sayings if you don't know what these sayings are? Most people avoid Revelation like the plague. But if we must keep these sayings, then we must read and understand what they are. And I think this also means the entire Bible. Believers are to guard or protect the book of Revelation. When he says heed, it can also be translated to guard, and in that sense it's a protective role but not only that, but to obey the book of Revelation and what it says. I have to protect from the people who want to destroy it, but I obey it. It calls for guarding this great book from its detractors who would uh, deny it, guarding it from the critics who would ignore it, guarding it from the false interpreters who would obscure it. Just as in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, Timothy is told, O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. There is definitely a guardianship here. In 2 Timothy 1, he says, retain the standard of sound words. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure entrusted to you. This is a treasure. This book of Revelation, it must be guarded against any detractors or those who would uh, interpret it falsely or would tamper with interpretation or obscure its simple and direct significance. But it's even beyond that. It's talking about obeying it. Obey is to heed. Obey the book with his commandments. And that is repeated throughout the section. He who loves my commandments and keeps them, uh, he is the one who loves me. Verse 21, same thing in verse 23. Same thing in chapter 15 and verse 10 of the book of John. Then you find in 1 John, 
If you love the Lord, you will keep his commandments. If you love his appearing, you'll keep his commandments. That's the whole point. If we believe that Jesus is coming imminently, he could come at any moment. And of course, if the rapture of the church starts it all, and, uh, uh, and the rapture of the church is the first thing, and then comes the time of the tribulation uh, when all the events are laid out. There's no event given in front of the rapture of the church. So it could happen any moment. It could happen before I finish this video. And so we live in every moment as if Jesus could come in the next moment because he could. And we have to live then obeying the mandates given in the book of Revelation to defend against detractors and critics and all of them. And they are called not to only guard it, but obey it. Think of it as a general command to long for Christ's return and our eternal fellowship with him. It calls believers to desire heaven, to desire holiness, to desire Christ vindicated and for him to triumph over his enemies, to desire the end of the curse and to desire the glories of Christ's earthly kingdom and the new heaven and the new earth, to see God's face, to end the Babylonian harlot, Babylon, and the corrupt commercial and political system, to look forward to the life of peace and happiness. Thus, the purpose of Revelation is not just to provide entertainment or to merely satisfy the curiosity of believers about the future, but to reveal the glory of God's Son, to call believers to live godly, obedient lives in light of his soon return. There are a number of New Testament texts that support this view of what we call imminence, certainty with uncertainty. It was certain that he is coming, but it was uncertain exactly when. And they were living in the first century as if he might at any time, but they didn't know when he would come. Some of the New Testament texts that help us with that, 1 Corinthians 1.7 describes a Corinthian church, and it says that they weren't lacking in any gift. We, they're not waiting on a gift to happen before the rapture. It meant that every gift that God, through his Holy Spirit, could bestow on the church, every ministerial gift, spiritual uh, gift of a teacher and leader he could give to his church, they have already received. Then he adds a waitly, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is a typical description of the attitude of the member of the early church waiting eagerly for the coming of Jesus Christ. They didn't push the return of Christ for his back for uh, way off into some future event. They believed it was imminent, that it could come at any time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says, don't go on passing judgment. In other words, you're not the person who can judge someone. Don't go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes who will bring the light of things hidden into the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. Literally live in expectancy of the coming of Christ. And they did. Then go to the 16th chapter of 1 Corinthians and you have this word that comes up. It's called Maranatha. And interesting enough, it's not translated. It is the Aramaic word Maranatha. It's not Greek. It's not Hebrew. It's Aramaic. That's interesting because as far as we can tell, nobody in Corinth would have spoken Aramaic except some Jews that may have been living there. But believe nobody in the Greek culture would have spoken Aramaic. Aramaic was the language of the people who lived in Palestine. And so why would the Apostle Paul, in writing the epistle to a Greek church in a Greek culture, include an Aramaic word that was untranslated. It's very interesting, but it means Lord come. It was a word that expressed a hope of the return of Christ. So why in Aramaic, really, an Aramaic phrase squeezed into one word? Why would the Aramaic phrase appear in a Greek letter to a Greek church? The only answer is it must have been a word they were very familiar with. It isn't even translated, as I mentioned. 
It must have been a watchword, a byword, a proverbial anticipation of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ that was so well known to everybody that Christians just said, Maranatha, Maranatha. It summed up the truth of a vital hope of believers that Jesus could come at any time. It expressed their imminent hope. They were saying to each other, Maranatha, our Lord come, our Lord come, our Lord come. They were living constantly in the light of the return of Christ. It was their hope. On a number of occasions, the Apostle Paul expressed that idea that he might live until Jesus returned. Some of the things in the Philippians uh, book in chapter 3, for example, it says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was waiting for Christ. He was waiting for the return of Jesus Christ. And he believed it could happen any time. 1 Thessalonians, here's Paul's commendation of the Thessalonian church. And he said about them, verse 9 of chapter 1, uh, you turn to God from idols to, to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. The early church was just filled with anticipation that Jesus could come at any moment. Chapter 4 of Thessalonians, it said, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. He's saying some of us may be alive at the return of Christ. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, For even when we were with you, we used to give this order, If anyone will not work, then let them eat. See, there was a problem with the uh, Thessalonian church. Some people weren't working. They were just waiting for God to come. It says, For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and to eat their own bread, meaning work. What does this have to do with the rapture? Well, they were preoccupied with the return of Christ. And they thought he was coming now and that things that Paul said and others said, Jesus said, that he would, he would come before they died. But that's not really what it, it meant. In verse 4, 15, it says, We who are alive and remain when he comes. They were living in the anticipation. So it kind of sums up this book. He's coming soon. With that in mind, verse 6 he says, and he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the Spirit and the prophets, sent his angel to show his bondservants the thing which must shortly take place. Here again, the emphasis is on he's coming soon. Let's look now at Revelation 22, verse 8. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. <clears throat> Heard and seen, John resumes speaking for the first time since chapter 1 and confirms the veracity of the revelation of his own eyewitness testimony, the basis of any reliable witness. Several times in Revelation, we see John overwhelmed by the presence and the power that the angel showed him. He, being overcome by the magnitude of all this, starts to worship the angel. Some people have false doctrinal centered on angel worship. We must not worship angels. They are created beings. We must worship the creator. We're warned over and over not to worship angels. John is told several times, Revelation, not to worship this angel. Back in chapter 19, he did it there too. He fell down at the feet. Only this time it says he fell down and worshiped. And he said, get up. The angel did. Don't do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. We both talk about Jesus. We're both to share the gospel. I'm not to be worshipped. Worship God, not me. I think, I think John just collapsed. I think uh, he was overwhelmed. When he, like Ezekiel, when he saw the vision, he saw, he collapsed. Like the three disciples at the transfiguration. Oh, they just crumbled. And then they said, oh, we want to make a tabernacle for you and we do all these things let's look at uh, verse 9 
But he said, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the word of this book, worship God. The angel commands John to worship God and God alone. Now, just as a footnote, the Roman Catholic Church advocates the worship of Mary, the worship of angels, the worship of saints. They call it veneration, but it's indistinguishable from worship. It is a violation of what the Bible teaches. We are to worship God alone. Verse 10, and he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is near. Don't seal up this prophecy. Previous prophecies were sealed up in Daniel. These prophecies are to be proclaimed so they can produce obedience and worship. The command not to seal this prophetic message is different than the Lord told Daniel. Remember in Daniel, he said, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time and to the end. But the time is at hand. This refers to imminency, which means that the end is next. The reason for the difference in instructions is simply stated, the time is at hand now. Since Jesus already opened the seven seals prophetically to reveal the future, it's only appropriate that the entire book remain open for us to read as well. In contrast with Daniel, who was told to seal up the book of prophecy, here we're saying, he said, seal not. The Messiah had come. The second coming is imminent. Now the time is at hand. Reason for the difference in the instructions is that one lived after the time of Christ's crucifixion. The other lived before. In Daniel's day, it was a long way off. In this day, it's a message to be spread now. It's to produce obedience and to produce worship. And that is his intention. Way back in chapter one, John was told to write a book, what you see and send it to the churches. Spread it, spread the word, Jesus is coming. To fail to preach revelation, to fail to proclaim revelation is not only foolish because back in chapter one, verse three, it says, blessed is he who reads and those who hears the words of this prophecy and heeds the things written in it for the time is near. Not only would you forfeit that blessing, it would be foolish, it would be sinful not to preach revelation. If there ever were a day to proclaim the truths, today is the day. And tomorrow will even be in a more important day and the day after that, if it exists, will be even more important because we'll be closer to Christ's coming. So, any preacher who fails to preach the book of the glorious realities to come to the return of Jesus Christ is is in essence sinful because it is a mandate. And yet today, few really preach it. As wonderful as the gospel record is, it tells us the first coming of Christ, that marvelous epistles which tell us about the theology that comes out of the work of Christ. This is now the book that exalts him the most. Not to preach the book is to fall short. Let's look at Revelation uh, chapter 22, verse 11 now. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Those who reject God's warnings will fix their eternal destiny in hell, where they will retain their evil and their filthy nature for all eternity. Those who respond to the warnings will fix their eternal destiny in glory and realize perfect righteousness and holiness in heaven. Verse 11 is not a command, but rather a statement of fact and a warning. Character tends to become fixed and unchangeable, determined by a lifetime of habitual action. The arrival of the end will prevent any change of destiny. Those who hear the truth but continue to do wrong will, will by that hardened response, fix their eternal destiny in hell. Conversely, those who continue to practice righteousness and keep themselves holy give evidence of genuine saving faith. When Christ returns, the deliberate choice of each person will be fixed in the eternal state. We cannot cover up from God. God sees everything into the heart. If you're a sinner, he already knows it. You don't have to tell him. If you belong to Jesus, he knows that too. Whatever you are, 
deep down Jesus already knows. Another way of interpreting this is the word still, some commentators see more. So let the one who does wrong do more wrong. Let the one who's filthy be more filthy, or righteous be more righteous, or holy be more holy. And what it's saying is if you're wrong in this life and you're more wrong in eternity, there's no good influence. If you're filthy in this life, you're going to be more filthy. When the, when the sinner refuses the message, the warning, there's no cure for the wrong. There's no remedy for filthiness except for Christ's blood. Once the, the Lord returns or, or once a, a person dies, his character is fixed forever. If the warning of the book are not sufficient to move men to repent, then let them remain in their unrepentant sin. The day comes when judgment falls and crush, crushes those who will not repent. Let's look at uh, verse 12. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I come quickly again. Imminence is the issue. Again, Christ declares the imminence of his return. This is in the red in the Bible. So this is Jesus speaking directly here. All Christians should be watching the eastern sky for, quote, in a moment when you think not, the eastern sky will open, the trumpet will blow, and Jesus shall shout. At that time, we will be called to heaven to be with him forever. According as his work shall be, only those works which survive God's testing of fire have eternal value. Our rewards will be for the things we have stored in heaven, works done by believers based on their faithfulness in serving Christ in this life, will be revealed by fire, will come through, and will be valued. Remember in Mark 13, Jesus said, Take heed, keep on the alert, for you don't know when the appointed time is coming, and my reward is with me to render to every man. The scripture is saying the same thing, our complete eternal reward. He's talking to believers. In 1 Corinthians, it says, he saw that our activities in life can be gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble. And wood and hay and stubble is not evil. It's just not wicked. I mean, it's not sin. It just doesn't have any eternal value. It just gets burned up. When the testing fire comes, it's gone. 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says that. There will be time of testing of all of our works. And that's our service rendered to God. The rest is trivialities of life that weren't evil. They just had no eternal value. I wonder how much of our lives live, maybe out of sin, but not value to heaven, not value to God. That reward that we will receive in glory will be a capacity to worship God and a capacity to serve him. So there's something in the values, the things that we did for value in heaven that will give us additional capacity to worship God in heaven and serve him in heaven. The greater capacity for praise and greater capacity for service our faithfulness in this life will give us that opportunity. Having knowledge that Jesus could return at any moment, shouldn't that lead Christians away from a life of idle, waiting for his coming? Instead, it should produce diligent, obedient, worshipful service to God and urgent proclamation of the gospel to believers. Try looking at it this way. By telling everyone you meet now about the good news of Jesus, but they don't listen to you. They Then suddenly the rapture happens. Those people will then remember everything you said to them. And that's why perhaps right after the rapture, more people will begin immediately to seek the truth about Jesus and will begin the largest soul harvest the world has ever known. Now the next few verses, starting with verse 13 and down to the end, is a response from non-Christians. God's final plea is given to those who are still rejecting. This final section we can divide into two points, the invitation and the incentives to respond. Let's look at verse 13. 
He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Now, here the Lord is speaking personally, and he's identifying himself with the same terminology we found back in chapter 1. This closing has many components from the very beginning of this great apocalypse. Chapter 1, I am the Alpha and the Omega, and here it again reminds us of that. Chapter 21, I am the Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. Now, why this? Well, the readers of the book of Revelation, the original readers were, of course, Gentiles. Because of that, in that part of the world, they spoke Greek. And so the Lord, in his inspiring, in this designation of Christ, identifies him by the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Alpha being the first, omega being the last. The point is, it expresses infinity, expresses eternity. It's boundless life, embraces everything is included, and transcends everything. That's just three different ways of talking about him. That kind of designation identifies completeness, uh, timelessness, sovereign authority. He's not just another man or an angel or a created being. He's not some superhuman genius. He's not a, a distinguished martyr. He is God eternal and almighty, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. These identifications, by the way, were given in Isaiah uh, in 43, chapter 44, uh, and then uh, uh, over in chapter 48, he says, listen to me, O Jacob, I am he, I am the first, I, I am also the last. My hand founded the earth, and so forth and so on. He's God, he's the Alpha and the Omega, he's the beginning and the end. Jesus Christ is everything. If there is an ark in which the family of Noah is saved, that ark is a picture of Jesus Christ. If there is a lamb slain in the Passover, that lamb is a picture of Jesus Christ. If there's a kinsman redeemer, that redeemer is a picture of Jesus Christ. Before time, after time, during time, he is the theme for everyone. And Paul says to the Philippians, every knee shall bow. Let's look at verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they might have the right to the tree of life and they might enter the city by the gates. The people whose robes are washed are those who have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, those who have been placed into Christ, and he has paid the penalty for their sins. Blessed are those who have washed their robes, who have been forgiven of their sins, being united with Jesus Christ. Isaiah 64 and Zechariah 3 talk about soiled robes, representing sinfulness and the idea of removing sin by cleansing. And it's given in Psalm 51 and Isaiah chapter 1. The writer of Hebrews also refers to the cleansing power of the blood of Christ. That is to say, being immersed in his death is how we are purged from sin. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Cleanse your conscience from dead works, it says in the book of Hebrews. First Peter, a wonderful statement. First Peter 1, he says, Knowing you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood. The blood cleanses sin. So he says, Blessed, happy are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life. It's indicated to be in New Jerusalem, very clearly in the description of heaven in chapter 22. Either side of the river was the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruits. And so he's saying that the only people who are going to be in heaven eating the tree of life are the ones who have the right to it. And they will be the ones forgiven of their sins. He adds in verse 14, and may enter by the gates of the city. Back in verse 20, or chapter 21, he describes the 12 gates were 12 pearls. And of course, they were the entrance into New Jerusalem, the capital city, the new heaven and new earth. Blessed are those who do his commandments, symbolize those who have been forgiven of their sins, who have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Those closing verses of the Bible make it perfectly clear that salvation 
is a matter of the will. Whosoever wishes may come. Whosoever wills not to become lost, not to be lost. Teaching abounds throughout Scripture in that. The one thing God asks of us. He doesn't ask for our money. He doesn't ask for anything before we're in Christ. He asks for our will, that our will would be his will, that we would change, that we would repent of our own will and give him our will so that we believe what he told us and we follow that. He describes the state, eternal state, as blessed, meaning happy. Who doesn't want to be happy? The way to eternal happiness is to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. The tree of life, the marvelous blessings of a lo loving God. They that do his commandments are believers. In John 14, it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. The tree of life indicated immortality and divine blessing. To be able to enter in through the gates into the city is to have heavenly citizenship in the eternal dwelling place of God and redeemed mankind. All believers are without, outside the city, in the lake of fire. James 1.22 says, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You see, we're, we're to be about the Father's business. If we are truly sold out to God and have made Jesus the Lord of our lives, the desire of our hearts will do his commandments. I love that phrase, to be sold out to God. That means I don't have any of my own will. It's all what God wants. Whatever you want, God, I'm there. Verse 15, he says, outside, outside the city are the dogs and the sorcerers, the sexual immoral, immoral and murderers and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. The dogs were considered despicable characters in New Testament times, low moral character, unfaithful leaders, and homosexual prostitutes are those who received such a designation. Sorcerers about witchcraft. The Greek word pharmakos is a root English word which means pharmacy, so it's talking about drugs. Whoremongers are those who practice all kind of sexual immorality. Greek pornos is the root of the English word pornography. Murderers means premeditated murder, not accidental killing, but they're included in the list. Revelation 21 verse 8 tells us, but the fearful, uh, uh, the fearful, the unbelieving, and the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all the liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We read that back in chapter 21. Idolaters just put, those who put anything ahead of God, anything ahead of God, including money or, or anything. Think about that. Idolaters are those who worship false gods or anything else that's unacceptable, but they don't worship God. It talks about a lie. Everyone sometime during their lifetime has lied. It's human nature. Some tell little lies. Some lies are acts of deceiving, and some can be very harmful to others. Simply withholding some of the truth when asked a question is lying. And some people constantly lie. Consider carefully how you answer. And instead of a white lie or withholding part of the truth, find another way. Tell the truth. I would rather be told the truth no matter how bad it is rather than find out later I've been deceived. Those who loveth and maketh a lie has to do with someone hurting someone else. Anytime we hurt someone else like that, it is sin. It's the habitual practice of that. Let's look at Revelation verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of, Hev of David, the bright and morning star. This is the first time that the words I, Jesus, appear in the entire Bible. It establishes that this final invitation in Scripture is not a human invitation, but a divine call issued personally to sinners by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The churches, remember the seven churches that we talked about earlier in this book, were the original recipients of this um, Scripture. And, and Revelation. The verse 
uh, is Jesus' sealed approval on the entire book of Revelation. It marks the first use of the word church since chapter 3. Why is there no reference to the church during the time of tribulation on earth described in chapter 6 through chapter 18? Because the church, having been raptured to heaven, will not be on earth all of that time. The root and the offspring of David. Christ is the source. He is the root of David's life and line of descendants, which establishes deity. He's also a descendant of David, which establishes his humanity. This phrase gives powerful testimony to Christ as the God-man. How can Jesus be the root and the offspring of David both in the flesh? This is impossible. David is in the flesh, was the ancestor of Jesus. In the spirit, Jesus was David's ancestor. Jesus was David's God. In 2 Peter, it says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day of the dawns and the day star arises in your hearts. That's Jesus. This is the bright star announcing the arrival of the day. When Jesus comes, he will be the bright star who will shatter the darkness of men's night and herald the dawns of God's glorious day. You see, it's not unusual in a symbolic way to speak of Jesus as a star. He is our bright star. Until we receive this star into our life, we are full of darkness. Verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires the, uh, the water of life without price. Verse 17 contains four invitations of the unsaved to come to Christ in faith for eternal life. The Spirit is the Holy Spirit and the Bride is the Church. The Holy Spirit works through the Church to evangelize the world. The water of life is eternal life available freely by faith in Christ. Come. This is the Spirit and the Church's answer to the promise of His coming. The Holy Spirit, since the beginning, has been saying, come. Unless the Holy Spirit of God woos you, you can forget about being saved because it is the Holy Spirit that draws you. It is God's wish that all would be saved. I believe what this is saying is in this particular instance is that the Spirit and the believers are saying, come, Lord Jesus. Salvation is open to whoever so will. Let him that heareth say, this is unlimited offer of grace and salvation to all those who desire to have their thirsty souls quenched. The Lord's last invitation to mankind is what we read. The Lord Jesus Christ, ever concerned for the souls of the lost, closes his great revelation with a challenge for individual people to call upon his name. He indicates that there are two who invites us, the Spirit and the bride or the church. God the Holy Spirit will use the printed page as well as those who are just repeating what they have heard but may not even believe what they're saying. But God uses the bride, the church, which indicated that the primary mission of the Church of Christ during the entire church age is to tell others about the Savior, is to know God, to draw near to Him and tell others. That's discipleship, and part of discipleship is evangelism. All Christians everywhere should be engaged in saying to their fellow human beings, whosoever is thirsty, let him come. Whosoever wishes, let him take the free gift, the water of life. When we talk to people, we're saying, are you thirsty? Well, what do you mean thirsty? Well, I mean, are you thirsty for life? Do you know the Lord? Do you know God? Do you know your purpose? Are you thirsty to know that? Then come. And that could be our evangelistic message. Some do not know what they're hungering for. It's so simple just to give and let Jesus bring you salvation, joy, and life that lasts forever. When we take this water of Jesus, it brings eternal life. Verse 18, I warn 
everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to them the plagues described in the book. And if we've read the book, there are a lot of plagues. We don't want that. The speaker who identifies, who testifies to the authority and finality of the words of the prophecy in this book is the Lord Jesus Christ. So you have the same kind of thing at the end of Scripture. Don't touch a word. Don't add to it. Don't, don't touch it. And make sure when you uh, interpret it, you're doing it correctly. The warning forbids any alteration of this book. We know some denominations have done that. They have created their own book. This is not just a book because we've heard the warnings repeated over and over. We could extend it to all scripture. Well, then why put it at the end? Why didn't put it at the end of Romans or at the end of Ephesians? He puts it at the end of Revelation because Revelation is at the end of all of Revelation. It is the end of the New Testament. It is the end of all scriptural revelation. And so it goes to sweep across all that's been given. And he has also put it at the end of Revelation because Revelation, uh, God surely knows, would be the most assaulted book that we have. And that is true. These words of Jesus then head off any attempt to add or subtract, distort, falsify, falsify or misinterpret. Now remember the book of Revelation when it was written immediately when it was disseminated to the seven churches very quickly. It would have been very unpopular, for example, uh, with Jezebel and her followers who were Thyatira. They wouldn't have liked that. And they got this book. It would have been very unpopular with the uh, propagators of the false religion that was going around. We talked about uh, Nicolaitan, uh, Nicolaitanism that was going on. Uh, they would have been upset. They wouldn't have wanted this book to come forward. It would have been uh, unpopular with the church of Thyatira who embraced the deep things of Satan. It would have been unpopular with the Jewish slanderers that are still assaulting this book as well as the New Testament. And so the warning is, don't tamper with it. It's the very end. The book takes us all the way to the eternal state, all the way to the end, to the end, to the eternal lake of fire, the eternal new heaven and new earth. This book takes us all the way. It takes the account of God's plan all the way to the end, so there's nothing added to it. Then we could say anything added anywhere in the scripture to any book in the scripture would have to be added to Revelation because Revelation is the end. If you wanted to add to Scripture, you would have had to, to be post the book of Revelation. Let's look at verse 19. And if anyone takes away from the words of the books of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and the holy city, which are described in this book. So we've talked about all this tampering and disparagement and uh, judgment against the book and all those things to detract, detract uh, from the word of God. This is not a reference to the Bible believing commentators of the word who may mistakenly translate some passage. Maybe I did somewhere inadvertently. The Lord's warning here is addressed to those who engage in deliberate falsification or misinterpretation of scripture maybe to say something they want to say. Still, it does serve as a soul-stirring challenge to those who have taken this in hand to write and to preach on this marvelous book. Don't take away. It's a play on words. If you take away from the words of this book, God will take away your part in heaven, the part you might have had if you hadn't tampered with Scripture. That's what it says. You take away... God will take away. A, a true believer wouldn't tamper with Scripture. See, they treat the Scripture with great respect. We think of the psalmist, Oh, how I love thy law. It, it's my delight every day. You see, God's Word is absolute, true, faithful, permanent, and complete, not to be altered, to be changed in any way. And the fact that this warning here indicates several things. First of all, that men would be prone to tamper Scripture uh, and probably prone to tamper Revelation more than any other. People who 
uh, or prone to want to make the Bible say what they want. Secondly, it indicates that men would deny its validity because it is so specifically prophetically uh, and that has been true even in the past. All the prophetic things that have been uh, mentioned in the Old Testament have come true in the New Testament. It also indicates that the Holy Spirit wants to make a final sweeping statement about what you do with Scripture altogether. Bottom line is, God has written it, don't erase it, and don't expand it. So, uh, if you abide in my word, he says, you are truly my disciples of mine. Anyone who loves me will keep my word. Let's look at verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. In light of the future expectation, what is now required of believers is outlined by Peter in 2 Peter. It's previously stated, surely I come suddenly when least expected. The cry of every Christian should be to come quickly, Lord Jesus, as I said before. John speaks for all true believers when he writes, Come, Lord Jesus, since Christians are those who have loved his appearing in 2 Timothy. Scoffers may mockingly ask in 2 Timothy, where, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues to be just as it was at the beginning of creation. But things will not continue forever as they were. Jesus will return just as Revelation predicts. If the certainty of Christ's return to judge sinners does not motivate people to repent, nothing else will. Amen. That means, so be it. And so we come to verse 21. And the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. The scripture is an expression of God's grace towards fallen humanity. Without the grace of our Lord Jesus, none of us would be saved. While we were yet in sin, Jesus died for us. Salvation is a free gift of God. If God is drawing you, then take up that. Change your will. Repent of it and say, I'm going to follow God and follow him with your feet. The Lord of glory, as he promised in scripture, offers heaven exclusively to those who accept his gracious invitation not because of your works, not because of your DNA or anything else. It's about your will. Without the grace of Lord Jesus, none of us would be saved. When we think about these prophecies, prophecies in scriptures, it's, it's like looking at a sky full of stars. You look up at the sky, sometime a very clear night, you see stars all over the place in orbits and everything. You could even see with a telescope them floating around. And, uh, as far as you know, uh, they're, they're all just uh, uh, painted uh, and, and they just look like little dots painted. But really, uh, they're kind of out there. They look like they're all in the same location and they're just little, little lights out there. But the matter of the fact, you're looking at stars that all appear to be kind of on the shelf, on the underside of the roof. They don't appear that, that way to us, but they are. Billions of light years separate from each other. And you know, that's how it is with prophetic truth. We look at the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, the Olivet Discourse. We look at Zechariah. We look at Isaiah and Jeremiah. We see these tremendous panorama of stars. But we can't see is the distance that separates all of these prophetic things. And so we're reminded in the end, the timing of these events and the spacing of these things uh, it's, unless it's particularly stated, is not known to us. So we live all the time with expectancy and yet sometimes wondering, well, why doesn't it happen? The point is everyone all the time better be ready and watchful and alert because he comes in a time that no man knows and in an hour when you think not. Until that hour, there is grace that may be the grace, it is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ with you all. And so I thank you for watching these videos. I pray that you were blessed by them.
because you will be blessed by the word of God. And uh, until we see each other again, God bless you.